Hello, everybody, and welcome at this NIAS talk at SPI 25 on uh, Thursday, Thursday, 10 December 2020. Next to me is Lara Bizayon, one of our speakers tonight. Um, and my name is Zara Kars, uh, the moderator tonight and uh, event manager at NIAS. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the Canadian immigration policy called medical inadmissibility, uh, in which people with chronic disease or de developmental otherness are barred from permanent residency to Canada. Um, and we're really going to talk about what is needed to unmake this policy, this practice, this issue, as uh, however you want to call it. And, um, uh, and about the question how to find an answer to make this, unmake this policy. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here and uh, to uh, present this wonderful program to you with three excellent speakers. Uh, Laura Bizayon, Emma, uh, Amy, Amy Koopman and Christine Krause. I will introduce them all uh, in a minute, but first let me explain a little bit about uh, what NIAS is. Uh, NIAS is the, International, the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities and Social Sciences. It's an international institute where an interdisciplinary group of scholars, artists, writers, journalists, researchers come together to work on individual projects, but also to really uh, collectively or to really collaborate and work together um, on, uh, on projects that really move uh, beyond the boundaries of their own disciplines and really to gain new insights in their own fields. Um, to give you an insight of what happens as NIAS, uh, what happens at NIAS, we organize this NIAS talk every month at SPI 25. Uh, and Laura Bizayon is one of our fellows right now. Um, Laura is a sociologist. Uh, she's an assistant professor of health and society at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Um, she uh, has been doing long-term research on HIV-related policy in the Canadian immigration system and on medical inadmissibility. And she has recently directed and written the animated film, The Unmaking of Medical Inadmissibility, which we are also going to uh, screen tonight. And it's quite special because this is the world premiere of this film. Uh, so that's uh, delighting. Um, before we screen the film, uh, I will do a short interview or a, a short Q&A with Laura and then um, on our research also. And then we will move on uh, with responses by Amy and Christine. Um, which also lets me, leads me to introduce uh, our other two speakers who will join uh, the stage after screening the film. Amy Koopman is a journalist, a writer, a researcher. Since recently, she has become a documentary maker. She's a homo universalis. Um, I guess you can say. Uh, she did a PhD research on empathy and literature, and she has written two novels, Het Boek van Alle Angsten, or uh, The Book of All Fears, and Orewoed, which I think is non-translatable. Um, she writes for the Volkskrant, uh, Investico, The Groene Amsterdammer, and Hart Hoofd. And recently, or in this or the past autumn, uh, you might have seen her on Dutch television, where she uh, 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 was um, she was on on television with her series Paradise Canada or Paradise Canada, uh, in which she uh, and her fellow documentary maker shed light on. Well, I guess you can say controversial uh, 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 issues uh, on the Canadian self-image, such as uh, issues on the oil industry, immigration, uh, or how Canadians deal with uh, their native peoples. Um, also part of our panel today is Christine Krause. She's an anthropologist working at the University of Amsterdam. And she really focuses on the intersection of political and medical anthropology. 
Um, she's interested in the health interface between state and the individual. And a uh, fun fact is that Krause was a NIAS fellow last year where she worked on a book project uh, on care in the city. So maybe it's me, but I think it's uh, going to be a very interesting night. Um, and um, before we start off, I think uh, it's good to mention two practical notes. Um, we are here at SPI 25, um, but the audience is at home. Uh, and um, if you want to raise any questions uh, during the film or during the panel discussion, please do. Um, and use the hashtag NiasTalk uh, on Twitter. And there are people here at SPI 25 who will check Twitter and um, uh, uh, raise your questions. And we'll try to include them as much as possible. Um, and another practical note is the fact that uh, I think at home you'll see two screens. Uh, so you'll see us on stage and the other screen is the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and it might be nice uh, to um, change to the PowerPoint uh, during the film. So you really see the film in high quality. Having said that, um, let's go to the, uh, to the Q&A and maybe um, to start off, Laura, welcome. <laughs> um, it's good to start with a clarification question um, and because I think that not everyone in the audience um, knows what medical inadmissibility is. And um, I was wondering, can you tell us a little bit about what this entails and also who it affects? Hello? Good. With pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for the introductions. And thank you to the venue, Spau um, and Denias, for, for hosting and our um, audience members here present and then, of course, online. Um, so to your question, right, uh, medical inadmissibility is, is a mouthful to say in English and in French, the two official languages of Canada, and it is a bureaucratic uh, set of processes. Um, medical inadmissibility is written into Canadian uh, immigration law, so the federal immigration um, Is it, is it working? Let's see, maybe we should uh, try a different one. Okay, there we go. Right, so medical inadmissibility is within Canadian immigration law, and it is, um, it's uh, a mechanism by which, um, uh, you know, by which people are either eligible or ineligible to, to remain in Canada permanently. Um, and so what it is, it's, a, uh, it's a, an economically predetermined uh, framework for assessment, for assessing people's applications uh, for permanent residency. And it's also then the discursive framework that uh, governs the work practices of professionals and bureaucrats within the immigration system or allied with the um, immigration system. Um, um, you know, it, it, guide, it guides their, 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 their immigration-related work. And so medical inadmissibility um, has existed before the country uh, came into being in, in 1867. So before the country had an organized immigration system, there has always been, as part of a vestige of English or um, yeah, English colonial uh, practice, right, of, of um, examining um, prospective immigrants, right, bodies that historically arrived by boat from from Europe and elsewhere, right. So the idea of wanting to welcome the the fittest and um, and 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 keep keep the rest out. So there, you know, there's a long um, history of this, and it, it, it's really a system that does predate uh, the introduction of 
uh, publicly subsidized, you know, universal health coverage in Canada in the 1960s. And so, yeah, there's a long-standing, um, uh, not in a European long-standing sense, but in a Canadian uh, sense, right, in a, in a North American context, um, long-standing practice, right, uh, related to... Um, uh, you know, governing governing the bodies of, of prospective immigrants. Yes, it's on again. Um, I think we'll discuss more during the, the the panel discussion. But what I was really curious about, having seen the film already, um, was how. I mean, you've been working on HIV uh, immigration policy. How did you come across this topic? How, why is it so important for you to uh, do research, research on this? Yeah. So, yeah. So I've been looking at this issue of, of, of medical um, decision making within the Canadian immigration system for about 13 years now. It was the subject of my PhD dissertation at the University of Ottawa. And I came to know this through my work in, in HIV at the community level and came to know of uh, Canada's mandatory HIV screening policy um, that that's, uh, was introduced in 2002. And so over the last years, I have done a... Uh, a study, a forensic uh, unpacking of the Canadian immigration system to understand how decisions about uh, people with HIV are made. And so how are these made in the practices of, I mean, how, how, um, how does the Canadian immigration system um, think about and, and make decisions about people living with HIV, which then led me to see and then develop ethnographic understandings of the, of the immigration system's um, medical regime, right? So medical and administrative uh, professional decisions that are made um, internal to the government apparatus, but actually being made, decisions being made um, in places all over the world, because of course most of the applications for uh, f that are made uh, by people who want to immigrate to, to Canada are made from outside of the country. So I was able to, um, yeah, I was able to unpack this large uh, government uh, apparatus and 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 make. Um, you know, rich uh, empirical fi findings to support the um, the to support the need for change, right? So came up with um, demonstrative evidence to show that there are problems, and I situated where exactly the problems uh, are, are are manifest and emerging, and with what consequence. And that's really a part of what's on show in the film. For the for your research uh, and also for the film, you interviewed a lot of people. How uh, I can imagine that some of these stories or many of these stories are quite heartbreaking, that people uh, cannot immigrate or are forced to leave uh, because of their uh, chronic illness or uh, their developmental otherness, uh, genetic otherness. Um, uh, how, how did that make you feel? Yeah, so the, I mean, for the, for the prior research for the HIV study, uh, yeah, did a lot of uh, interviews and observation in government uh, places and outside of the government as, as well, and uh, reviewed a lot of uh, government texts, official texts and unofficial texts, people's immigration paperwork, also what's mentioned in the film. Um, but, you know, really what the, what the research does is... Um, um, it uses, and, and then again on show in the in the film is is really using people's um, story to showcase to underline really um, how much work is involved in making an immigration application, and then you know the immigration health work really as a form of of work right that's involved that when you ha when you're diagnosed and um, institutionally othered. Um, by the Canadian government, well, that triggers all sorts of other uh, uh, disease s scrutiny. Um, interestingly, it also positions doctors in, um, you know, 
professional dilemmas, uh, ethical dilemmas, practical dilemmas, and that's really where you know change is needed in the creation, in the very creation of um, of immigration files, right? In in the immigration uh, medical assessment, you know, is is really the place that needs to change. So yeah, the stories are, and and the film is really an opportunity for us to to stop, um, not only hold a, a mirror up to ourselves, to realize that we are all. Um, actually made of skin and bones and decomposing at this very moment, right? That we, we all are frail and have frailty. And I think Corona at this very moment shows that, you know, um, everyone is susceptible, right, to any sort of disease or, um, um, or you know, in this case, a, a virus, right? So it's an, it's an oppor- the film really is an opportunity for us to hear stories and ask ourselves what these stories are telling us, Right. Yeah. So and the, and the focus in the film is is really I'm using narrative story to make um, politically engaged points, right? So um, yeah, and, to, and, and maybe s- to 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 make a very abstract policy, really uh, to show the lived experience of the people involved. Yeah, yeah, and and to and to start there. I mean, the, the starting point is the stories, right? Because if they're, um, yeah, the, the lived experiences, our uh, experiences are the starting point, um, um, and the and the ethnographic st- starting point within this film. But you know, the people aren't the objects of analysis here. The objects of analysis really are the medical and the legal and the administrative relations and and the knowledge created. Um, about people with chronic illness and developmental or genetic otherness, because you know the, the core finding in, in in the prior HIV study, but in in this line of examining, as is that you know medical admissibility happens through the practices, um, people's practices, our practices, right? This sort of uh, professional and bureaucratic practices, and then and what happens through that is that. People with chronic illness and developmental or genetic otherness are systemically uh, disadvantaged um, because they're socially produced as risks, as legal risks, as health risks, um, and so disadvantaged from the get-go. Yeah. And so that's that's really the you know that that's really the the, the the empirical finding right yeah so if you the, the film is called the unmaking of medical inadmissibility as like the the, the neos talk tonight um when you use the term unmaking do you then also refer to really those practices um yeah i, I mean i really want the stories to um trouble us right i want this I'm concerned that we're not concerned by this, or I'm I'm concerned that I'm concerned about having us concerned. I'm concerned about having um, my country men and women, right? I'm concerned about bringing this to the attention of Canadians. Um, there are universal themes. So how are we doing this in the Netherlands? How are we doing this in the EU? Well, I would argue that there are universal. Um, um, learnings um, and potential insights that we can gain here, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to open Pandora's box and, and as Amy Koopman's film Paradise Canada did, I mean, telling some uncomfortable, um, telling, some con- telling stories that are uncomfortable, and they, they are uncomfortable, they, they, they should be uncomfortable, because they, um, they are disturbing, right? And they help us. Um, the promise here is that um, as we make laws, policies, and uphold regulations, so can we undo them, right? And so, so a film in animatic form, as this film is, is a way, f- as an entry point, for all ages to be able to see. And once we've seen and heard and been challenged by what we see, well, then we can never unsee. And yeah. we can then perhaps ignore or perhaps collectively do something. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we watch the movie, I have one last question about 
about it because you created this in collaboration. You didn't do this by yourself, but you created it with some of your students, right? Right. How did that? Uh, how did that collab come about? Come about, and how did it go? Did it? Did, yeah. Tell, tell me yeah. more. Yeah, <laughs> it was terrific. So, um, so this film was um, made between May and September of this year, and it was funded by the uh, made with funding from the Humanities Institute at the University of Toronto, and the Canadian Bar Association, that funds programs of research that um, that intend, in this case, legal reform legal education, but in this case, legal reform. And for a number of years, I've wanted to make a film. And because, uh, and my book will come out um, in the next year or so, but because of the research evidence that I was sitting upon and could make conclusions based on the empirical findings and make recommendations for change, I said, well, now is the opportunity. I have some funding. I have the support of the university. And let me hire some students. So I hired six students, and we worked together. And let me just name them, because they are here. Please do. Virtually. Um, there's Amy. There's Ida. There is um, Tanya. There is Ujwal. And there is Zihan. And they are in China, they are in India, they are in Costa Rica, and they are in two Canadian cities, in Vancouver and in Toronto. And so we worked, uh, this was a Corona, this is a Corona success story. Because, no way, yeah, nice. Yeah. We worked at distance. Um, it was all virtual, I've only met one of the students, but we worked, and they worked like bandits or thieves, or what, what is the right way to say that? Very, very hard for over three months, full dedication. One of the, the collaborators has personal association with this uh, story in that the, her family was rendered medically inadmissible and is in Costa Rica. That's Tanya Montoya. And the students uh, with gusto um, embarked on me with this event, um, on, on this adventure. And so they are artists. They are graphic artists. They are illustrators. They are filmmakers. And so they taught me about the makings of documentary film. And it's in, it's in animatic form. And it was, um, you know, they, they used my research to inform. And in this film, really, we... Um, we take on or we expose one contradiction. In my view, there are at least five contradictions that this medical and admissibility regime present, and this, this, uh, this film looks uh, at one of those contradictions. Um, and that, you know, that was really the starting point. And we, we produced this um, as a collective, so a feminist-inspired collective in which uh, we shared ideas, we co-created, and so this was a brilliant model of success. Intergenerational, obviously, I'm not in my early 20s, so this was a great example of uh, interdisciplinary engagement, but inter uh, intergenerational um, yeah, uh, learning and partnership, and really, you know, the sort of learning was, was reciprocal. Cool, nice. Yeah. Well, I this think is this great. is a perfect uh, introduction to the film, and I think uh, it's uh, about time we're going to uh, see it. Um, so I think with a little bit of help from our uh, SPUI 25 colleagues, we are going to start it. So please, people, switch to your other screen, and um, we'll see you in a, in a few minutes. 13, yeah. <laughs> Canadians would march in the streets if their federal immigration system excluded applicants on the basis of the color of their skin, as it once did. And yet, neither the late Stephen Hawking nor Magic Johnson would be able to settle in Canada. The reason for this is Hawking was disabled and Johnson lives with HIV. As it stands, prejudice on the basis of a person's health and development statuses are written into Canadian immigration law. People with chronic illness and developmental or genetic difference are excluded from permanently settling on health grounds, with some exceptions. 
The legal term for this is medically inadmissible. Such barriers to permanent immigration are undesirable. The logic of health-based exclusion is not self-evident and remarkably, Canadians know woefully little about this topic. A key contradiction comes to mind. While Canada recognizes the value of immigrant labor, the state's decision-making about people with certain health conditions precludes their contributions to Canadian society. As an ethnographer, I begin in a story. I met with more than three dozen immigrant and refugee applicants with HIV to discuss their immigration process from their perspectives as people living with chronic illness. Tell me what was involved, how things happened within your immigration, medically and beyond, I began. In response, women produced sheets of folded papers from inner compartments of handbags. Men retrieved thin beige file folders from locked leather-brown briefcases. To rendezvous with me, people boarded public transportation with their stacks and stacks of legal paper-sized accordion-style cardboard folders. Clamped down under armpits or wrapped up in plastic bags within bags to protect the documents if it was snowy or rainy outside. The physicality of people's briefcases, folders and purses, and all the culling, organizing and protecting that people do to take care of their contents makes a crucial point. Embarking on an immigration application process is physically demanding work for people and their families. By design, people's immigration paperwork, all the slips of paper, receipts, proofs of payment, official forms, online test results, instructions given to them by border guards, other state officials, lawyers and doctors, renders them institutionally visible, as well as legible and actionable. Migrants know this, and as such, guard the texts they amass preciously. While the Canadian-born person rather easily carries such state-issued documents around with them in a wallet, not giving much thought to this practice of habit, a ubiquitous practice in immigrant households is the husbanding of official documents, packed away inside a box or other improvised holder of documents, that over time ends up getting inched to the back of a closet. While perhaps unseen for years, all the inhabitants of immigrant households know where these documents are. They know of their existence. Their home societies are textual rather than digital societies, and they work so hard to get the documents in the first place. This is Martha, whom I met a decade ago. She contacted me by email after learning that I was researching the Canadian immigration system and its treatment of people with HIV. I have something to say about that, she told me. We met in her apartment in a low-rise building in a poor neighborhood in Montreal. Her home was lovely. The building was falling apart. Martha described what happened in her immigration interview with Canadian immigration officials in Russia, where she was living and studying at the time. The officer assessing her said that she may not find work in her field, or, further still, that she might have to do this and that for work. What? Are my ears playing tricks on me? She thought. After all, she was fluent in both Canada's official languages, two African languages, and also Russian. She would soon hold a doctoral degree in applied sciences. All of these were in her favor within Canada's points-based immigration system. She quieted the uneasiness she felt triggered by the officer's line of questioning. At the end of the interview, the official said she was a very good candidate for permanent immigration. The next step was to travel to Moscow to do an immigration medical examination. She felt happy, another thing to cross off her to-do list. Six weeks later, as Martha sat in her university dormitory room, the phone rang. There's something wrong with your medicals. We need to see you again. Martha pressed for details. What's wrong with my medicals? Can you tell me? She was told that no, this could not be discussed on the phone. When you come here, it's quite confidential. We will let you know. Martha paused before continuing. I was scared. I suspected that I might have HIV. This was the gossip among us foreigners. You don't want a call back from the immigration doctor. This is a bad omen. This can only mean bad news. All sorts of things raced through my mind. 
an HIV positive diagnosis would bring on personal troubles. It would bring on disease specific state surveillance. My immigration process had just become really complex. I have been preparing my application for the last three years. If I have HIV, I can now never get to Canada. Ever. I learned about its medical inadmissibility regime. That people with illness, disability, and development otherness cannot immigrate. As I sat with the immigration doctor, he confirmed my HIV status. My heart sank. I would have to go back home. In Russia, foreigners with HIV are reported to the state and then expelled. People like me are officially prohibited. Going back home with difficult access to medicine, I thought, that will be the end of me. I accompanied Winnie, a woman born in Southern Africa, to an interview within her refugee application process. We sat in the waiting room of a highly securitized federal building, waiting for her name to be called. Waiting, waiting, she said. Always so much, hurry up and wait here. Always so much, wondering what's coming next. Hmm? She offered me strawberries. This led us to chat about recent work she'd done that I had not, to that point, known about. In my field notes, I jotted down that it was through her networks of immigrant women from Africa that she had lined up work for herself picking strawberries in a rural area. She did not have any idea where. It was a 45-minute bus ride away from the city. All the workers rode the bus together. Hardly any white Canadians went strawberry picking, she remarked. Who else but immigrants? used to hard work, could do this type of back-breaking physical work where temperatures are hot, conditions tough. I asked her about how the company ran things. She explained that things seemed highly organized. The employers seemed to know what they were doing, seemed used to it. She said, I get cash in hand for this work. No questions asked. Immigrating to Canada is expensive, emotionally, financially, and in so many other big and small ways. People have to get used to and accept uncertainty about state decisions being made about them for what are often years at a time. There are layers upon layers of fees applicants must figure out how to pay either up front, before coming, or once in Canada. I interviewed a woman named Stella. As she described her immigration experience, we found ourselves looking at each other through tears. She had come to Canada on a work visa. She found contract work in a hospice where she cared for elderly people. A single mom, her young daughter, accompanied her. Four years went by and Stella applied for permanent residency. She wanted to remain in Canada. Her daughter Yvonne had learned French and English and made good friends at school. They were happy. They went for the required medical examination. Your daughter has a disability, the immigration doctor told them. This was not news to Stella. Their application process turned downward as they learned that they were ineligible to immigrate. She had cared for elderly people with disabilities, and now they were being refused because of costs for caring for Yvonne. As a care worker, the irony of this is not lost on me, Stella told me. She heard their health-based exclusion talked about in the cool, detached, bureaucratic language of excessive demand. When we met, Stella had already booked her flight to her home country. Her work visa was up, and they were leaving in less than three months. Yet they were socialized as Canadians. Their lives were happening here. They were leaving a lot behind. As she and I parted, we embraced, and fresh tears welled in our eyes. When people accepted to be interviewed, we commonly met in their homes. Women were active in faith communities giving their labor at churches, mosques, and aid service organizations. Alas, this was in lieu of paid employment. It was also what they learned from fellow immigrants what they should be doing to be able to then show and tell that they were good immigrants. Women and men were always on the hunt for paid work. Interviewees are rooted in collectivist kinship relations, which means that they are responsible to and for large swaths of people near and far. 
What happens to people who settle in Canada directly affects what happens to people they love and support in places far removed from the country. Their siblings, parents, guardians, children, spouses, neighbors, communities, and extended families in countries dotting the globe. Immigrant applicants with HIV and other would-be immigrants with disability and developmental difference are the most determined people I know. They are empathetic precisely because they are positioned in the social margins. My interviewees are prepared to work and work hard, which they do, whether they get paid for the work or are enlisted to volunteer. At menial, temporary, and service jobs, they get channeled toward once they settle. And this makes a vital point. Othering and denying people who apply for permanent residency because of assumptions built on prejudice about them related to their HIV or other health conditions is discriminatory. The practice of medically excluding persons with chronic illness and developmental or genetic difference has existed since the latter 19th century in Canada. But in the here and now, this persistent legal fact and the institutional practices it gives rise to places Canada at demographic odds with itself. The country's population is only replaced by and grown through immigration. Yet residency and citizenship barriers impede the movements of a global workforce on which Canada depends. A nanny migrant mother of a disabled child or a university professor parent to an offspring with Down syndrome who could not bring their child to Canada or obtain permanent residency because of health-based prejudice are net losses to Canadian society. And so while Canada recognizes the value of immigrant labor, a troubling tension presents. In practice, medical inadmissibility precludes the contributions of people with illness, disability, or certain health conditions. How would you feel about being discredited, singled out, disproportionately probed, and being rendered inadmissible because of your health status? With that question, I would like to ask both Amy and Christine to um, enter the stage. Uh, you can, I think it's wisest to come with the stairs because it's, it's quite high. Um, <laughs> you can choose a, a seat. Welcome both. It's very good to have you here. Um, so I would like to ask you both to respond briefly uh, to the film uh, uh, before we uh, continue to the panel discussion. D does any, does one of you want to start? Um, can I give uh, Amy the word? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Laura, for this. For this, uh, I saw it before, so now uh, I have to say it's very clear. But of course, because I saw it twice, yeah, then it's easier. Um, uh, ooh, so a, a first response is also difficult because it's the second time. Um, I know that my my first response was uh, to be critical, because I, I always go into the contra meme, like <laughs> whatever you're doing, I'm gonna try and see what the other side is. So um, for me, uh, the, the question it raised was, okay, so what's the logic behind uh, medical inadmissibility? Is it just this, this old fashioned thing that's still in there by accident? Um, or uh, does it have a logical economic basis for Canadian society? Like, what is excessive demand? I think I saw somewhere. 20,000. Oh. oh, maybe that's so far. Oh, it's doing it again. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. Um, $20,000 uh, per a certain period of time. So, so um, I'm really wondering about the criteria that are used because of the point system, and I think you really have to explain this later for everyone, that Canada already has a very discriminatory um, regime put in place for migration, 
as all countries do in some sense, but Canada can really select the people that it wants. Um, so then, yeah, then then I I get if you if you have that selective system in place and you have more people wanting to come in than you can allow for, um, who are you going to choose? And is it on economic uh, factors or is it or is there still the fear in there as well, which? I think would play a role with HIV, with viruses. Um, and of course, I think you need to know what exactly is the logic, and I think you know, uh, in order to unmake it and to, to challenge the logic. So that was my initial reaction. Thank you very much. Um, Lara, do you want to respond immediately, or should we move on to Christine and then... Uh, you, yeah, all right. Christine. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Uh, yeah, I think I want to uh, continue where Amy started, and but also to repeat what you said in the beginning, uh, that I think one of the big questions uh, this topic and your film raises is in what kind of society and world do we want to live? And do we want to consider that we are all vulnerable or, as you said, in one or another state of decomposition, decomposting, decomposition. Uh, yeah, so in a way we are all more or less disabled, like there is this, con this continuum of abledness and disability. And um, that is not at all an innocent question, that is a very important one, because like our whole life and everything depends on dependency, that we are dependent on some people, and this myth that we could be independent and that we that we could be so ever productive is is a very violent myth um, so it's also a myth w worth fighting so but that also makes me wonder about one thing and that is the the centrality of productivity still in your stories because like what what the topic very clearly shows is this extractivist logic of uh, capitalist nation states towards um, potential new citizens and how can you get the most out of them and so on and so on and so on. Um, uh, but also this very strange thing, um, what is happening actually around sick bodies or vulnerable bodies or suffering bodies. And because there are also these stories um, that uh, capitalist democratic states uh, cannot bear if people rot on their streets because that is against their self-understanding and then they need to act. So if things get really bad and worse, then they need to act. So there is also this logic of an illness clause, like for instance, if you, um, uh, if you want to apply for, for, for st to, to remain, and then you can show that you would die if you wouldn't stay based on your bodily condition. You can also be, in very rare cases, you can get a leave to stay on compassionate grounds. So I find it very interesting how two times we see a sick body um, uh, uh, kind of like allowing you to get rights to stay or kind of like hindering it. But like the, the first question I wanted to ask you, are you not actually criticizing this productivist logic? And why is it then so central still in your film? Because I mean, that is the big question you are asking, I think. Thanks, Christine. Laura, do you uh, want to respond? Sure. And the mic, it's, it's on? I think, yeah, yeah it, it's, okay. it's on, yeah. OK, good, thanks. Um, where to start? I should have, like Christine, I should have bought a, a pencil and paper, I guess. The, um, so let me start by saying, yes, yeah, so this, this uh, regime within the Immigration Act is, um, is disabilist. And by that, I mean it is, um, it, it, is unfavorable or it disfavors, if that's a word, people who live with a, a diagnosable illness, right? Because a disease arguably only exists if it's able to be diagnosed, right? So if you're if you live with a diagnosable chronic illness or a developmental condition or something in your gen genetic makeup that that raises the concern of the Canadian immigration system. So, so the idea is that you know, it, it is disabledist in that it dis, disfavors such applicants and their families, and it is intended to do so, right? So any immigration act anywhere in the world is, is about delimitating 
um, us and them, but you know who, who can come to a country, on what conditions they can enter, and on, on what conditions they can be ushered, um, shown their hat and ushered the door, right? So that's what an immigration act and its regulations and all of the directives that come out of the immigration and immigration act anywhere, um, and all of the instructions to its doctors that it hires or the lawyers that that are paid to help people immigrate, right? So, so that, you know, that is the spirit of um, the medical program within the Canadian immigration uh, system. Um, I will say that, you know, this medical inadmissibility regime makes Canada exceptional within the world, within um, Organization of Economic uh, Development Countries, right, 36 at, at this particular time, Canada is one of very few nations to gatekeep based on a person's medical status. So, of course, um, Australia, New Zealand, or other um, are other f former colonies of of Great Britain, right? So, it's no coincidence that those regimes are also the most heavy-handed in terms of a person's body. Um, and so part of what I'll say is that, you know, all right, so we know, and, and, and now there's, you know, the last years worldwide critique of colonial practices and their implications, and we can agree that we're now deconstructing and challenging and creating new ways of, 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 of living, right? So, um, and being in society. So this sort of logic that was introduced in the 19th century and that prevails since then in the 21st century um, no longer have their place, right? And, and need to be rethunk, thought about, that can't be a word, thought, thought, thought about and where problems manifest uh, change, right? And so your, your point about valuation, um, you know, f so yeah, so this, the, the, the medical inadmissibility system operates through this clause called the excessive demand clause, which is a, a switch that's activated when a person's um, health care costs in particular um, are above a certain criteria. And so... You know, th that is, as I mentioned before, you know, th that sort of economic financial um, predominance is both the assessment in terms of spreadsheets and pencils on paper, like the, the, the actuality of it, and then it's also the frame of reference for everybody to organi organize themselves professionally within the bureaucracy to be sorting... Um, sorting these applications, right? And so that's how um, a person with chronic illness or genetic, you know, a genetic condition or a, um, a recognized disability are disadvantaged from, from the very start of their application process, from the, the doctor's making of, a, of, of an immigration um, m medical file on which, you know, that's the sort of basis that all of the rest of the person's immigration application is going to be, uh, is, is going to happen, right? So it's very, very important within the Canadian system is this um, medical examination. And so, yeah, so, so while most countries call them Western or call them Northern of the Global North uh, screen, and, and the Netherlands is, is also concerned about people's bodies as they're being admitted into the borders of the Netherlands, for example, so people are, are probed and their health uh, canvassed and monitored, but they're not ex they're not excluded and they're not excludable based on that. Um, and I guess I, I am firm, and um, as are disability scholars and current research in you know. Um, the study of neurology, right, or the neurosciences to say that, you know, people with illness, us included eventually, the idea that we are all here for a short time, a good time hopefully, and, and a short time on earth, right, but that we're, we're, all, we're, we're already outgoing sort of thing. Um, you know, people's, um, the, the valuation, if we are going to 
value and evaluate, then it shouldn't be um, based on an economic logic. It should be on the inherent value, right? So people, people with illness and people with genetic otherness and different genetic makeups, right? I mean, they're, they, they are valuable in and of themselves, and they, uh, you know, offer us teachings and learnings that we might, if we don't live with such conditions, otherwise overlook. Um, yeah, Christine was also asking about the um, the productivity in your film, and ha are you not criticizing this? Yes. Um, yeah. So can you respond to that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so I mentioned that this medical and admissibility regime um, poses a number of contradictions. Um, and in one film, we dealt with the contradiction of bodies equated with economic logic or an economic productivity um, mode of, of thinking. So we are critical of it, but it is the dominant um, frame. It's the, it's, it's, it's the dominant um, way. It's a dominant frame um, has been, I, I think, throughout our Western societies since the 70s. We might call it a neoliberal sort of uh, way of, of thinking, right, of, of equating um, ourselves with our economic worth, and so this is what we 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 took this on um, because it is the dominant um, narrative. I, I, I guess it's the it's it's the most common place that um, people go when I speak about this, whether to students or in other venues, even such as this one. Um, and it's what we decided then to take full on as a way to. Um, join others in conversation about troubling the waters of the economic overdetermination or predetermination of ourselves as as humans. So the devaluing that happens when we focus on an economic logic. Can I come in again? Yeah, of course. Um, Go for it. Uh, yeah, I'm. I. I understand that point, but I'm wondering because, like, in a way, you open up that field again, and that you, then you also enable people to ask really nasty questions, which is basically who will who will pay for this? And but I think that is a very interesting question because why why can a country like Canada not say we we will stop caring, we will just leave you alone? Why actually not? And I find that is actually the conundrum. Yeah. Why can we not stop caring? You know, because like there is something in, in, I don't know what it is actually, in the self-understanding of, like why, why can the community not say, come in, come in, we extract all the labor we can from you, and if you are sick and if you are dying, we don't care, we just leave you. But that is actually not possible, apparently. Why is that? Um, um, lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah. yeah, whilst you're, th you're thinking, I was actually wondering, uh, Amy, uh, you said your first response was to really question the logic of this system, but then it sounded a little bit as if watching the film again might have changed your, your train of thoughts. Um, is that so? And I was also really wondering you've you've lived in you lived in Canada for a while and um, uh, um, I was wondering is this this othering or this very uh, exclusionary way of, of of treating immigrants so to say is that something you find uh, happens more often is that very typical Canadian, so to say, I mean, you, with an outsider's view. Uh, can you... So my outsider's <laughs> view of Canada is that it is very neoliberal. Uh, I think we are already quite neoliberal in the Netherlands, but just to give an example that for every 
event that was like an uh, so for example a walk against violence against women there were first like 20 sponsors that they had to uh, and and they were all so they they were mostly uh, these companies that were supporting but then of course they had to be mentioned immediately and it was that was just a very small thing but also that people uh, seemed to get uh, very little sick days uh, at least the bus driver we followed, who of course he had this master's degree but could not get uh, a job in his fields, so he was a bus driver. Um, he he had to get back to work immediately after this very important court case that dealt with an attack that he had personally experienced, and he could not get this day free from work. So, and I felt it was going on a lot in Canada that people just have to work, work, work more in Toronto than in Montreal. Um, but so I, I felt like the general uh, sense in Canada is that you, you have to be really hardworking and that's what migrants are. Uh, they, they are selected on, on that basis, on their diplomas and on age as well. You cannot be too old. I think that's I, I, that, that goes uh, quite along with uh, disability as you said we're all decomposing so the older we get the higher the chance that we are decomposing uh, so i think you raise very uh, important questions and you said it's about inherent value but how could you ever select people on inherent value and then if you are excluding someone what does that mean for that person so you have no inherent value um, so i think the selection criteria if it is true that there are more people who want to come in than can be let in, if that is actually true, I'm not sure, but I guess. Otherwise, indeed, why have any screening? Why just not let everyone in and say, okay, well, you figure it out what you're gonna do. Um, so if you need to screen, then why would this not be something you would need to screen for? I think that's... Uh, a difficult question for for you wanting to unmake this. Yeah. So my my thoughts return to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think the the idea that um, countries can select and they should select, right? So it's the I thought of the analogy, perhaps, of who do we want in our house when we organize guests to come, right? If we can perhaps compare the country with the home, right? Who do we want to receive? Well, I think we want to not receive people who are harmful to others, who have demonstrated to inflict harm on others. And short of any anything else... Um, Short of that, I would welcome anyone into my home, right? So a person with Down syndrome would be welcome because would enrich the evening. A person with Asperger's syndrome or autism would be welcome because sharing perspectives that uh, I, I don't know about or that offering insights that whether you live, whether you, if you don't live with those conditions, you won't know about or... Uh, within a Canadian context, a, a manageable chronic condition such as an HIV or such as a diabetes, right? So, you know, countries should should and, and do uh, make decisions about who they want, right? Um, so the devaluing, the de facto devaluing, and also that, you know, that's happening sort of systemically before people can even sort of reach, um, really is the problem, right? Um, and we can stem that by drilling down to what's actually happening and curbing some practices that are happening and have been happening for a long time based on assumptions built on prejudice but that give rise to discriminatory and problematic sort of practices and so um i think i mean and and, and that's those that's really the point right that um we should not devalue and then not assume that all sorts of bodies don't already, by their existence, make contributions, right? So that, um, you know, the contributions of families where the child lives with Down syndrome, the you know, the contributions of the individual himself or herself um, 
contribute both in the marketplace and outside of the marketplace. Um, and I think that the world over, we are, um, you know, and, and always have set ourselves up within mercantile s um, systems, right? That you sort of bartering and trading or, you know, sort of the, 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 the exchange of money and the, um, the, um, you know, the, the, the costs and, the, and, the, and our institutions that are deeply, by this point in our history, deeply um, um, characterized by, you know, emphasis on rational choice or individual action. I mean, and, and that's, that's the world over, right? And the, I mean, that's not going away. It's, it's been a long time um, in the coming, right? Those are, those are shaped by historical sort of practices and, and, and specific decisions at the political and, and, and governance level, right? But, but here where we see um, that, that harms are um, happening within practices, professional and bureaucratic practices, and we, we have the opportunity to then... Um, you know, hear the accounts of those who have been subjected, right, and learn from from those people who have been subjected, but whose viewpoints and standpoints and um, experiences with the system, you know, with the law, with the practices, are to are 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 you know uh, to this point elided, right, or haven't been haven't been uh, made visible. Yeah. It, it, oh, yeah. You go for, go for it. <laughs> I, I wanted to, to, to jump in, in your kind of like idea to think in terms of a house or a home. And uh, yeah, because I think that makes again, again the point or allows us, because I, I really want us to think a different world. You know, I don't want us to, to, to get, get stuck with a world where you have to discriminate at the borders. So like, what would this world look like? And like, if you think about a hospital home, hospitality, and like, if you think with gift exchange, uh, theories, you know, I'm an anthropologist, I'm, I may kind of raise gift exchange theories. It's actually the person who gives or the party who gives who is rising in status. It's not the person uh, who receives. And uh, so like a basically the home which can praise itself to be very hospitable and to receive everybody and to also take good care will reap the fruits later on. You know, like, so like also like to think in different kinds of temporalities uh, that, that, we, that we can allow in and then also not to kind of like subject our self understanding to this kind of extractivist logic. I think that's what your film is pointing to. That's kind of like why I, I, I find this so important that we think beyond that. And I think we can also really make strong points about that, that in, if we do that, we live in a better world. I mean, if we think about all the challenges we are facing, I mean, COVID can be taken as a case where you should screen at the border, but it can also be seen as a case where borders are absolutely nonsense. I mean, look at Europe, you know, like the, the, this kind of like little place on the world map with, with all these different countries, all these different languages, all these different histories, and where they kind of then started to close the borders again, which is absolutely nonsense, you know, because like the virus is traveling. So in that sense, uh, I think also traveling viruses teach us that we are in interconnected, interconnected, interdependent, and like then also all the theories about like how that is related to the extravist logic towards nature and so on. So in that sense, I really want to make that point strong. And I love your analogy with the home, because I think it can show us that a home which is hospitable is actually a strong home and also a home to be proud of and to have a lot of value placed in if i if i may uh, 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 um, yeah well uh, i i really like that analogy as well and i also uh, quite i think what you said about that not devaluating is or that devaluing is really the problem and that and we should look more at the contributions that we could get um uh, um, thinking about that, I was wondering, um, I guess, or I, I suppose that for your research, you also spoke to many lawyers, health practitioners, um, people really in this system. How do they, how do they perceive this? Do they feel like they might have a, do they feel like they have a role in this, in maybe changing this system? Great question. So, um, so this issue is um, widely and wildly unknown, and so that's what this body of research will change. 
because it's the world premiere, as we mentioned, of the, of the film, but it's the first time that the, the set of issues is on the world stage, literally, right? Um, to my knowledge, the only other place in the world where this issue has made the press and been discussed is in the, in, in the, in the context of Costa Rica, and this is where uh, my colleague Felipe Montoya, whose daughter was one of the creators of, of, of our film, um, was returned to, right? So, um, had lived in Canada, was a university professor, and applied for permanent residency and, and, and was refused, was then granted stay on uh, humanitarian and compassionate grounds and decided on principle to return to Costa Rica where they're thriving and would have thrived and contributed to, to Canada but it, or, or elsewhere. Um, and so to the point about, you know, what mobilization you know, has, has existed on this issue um, and how are professionals, lawyers and doctors involved. Um, the lawyers who have been involved are um, not-for-profit or pro bono lawyers, right, working within legal aid systems, so continued dismantling of a, of a public legal system in the province of Ontario where, 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 where we live. Um, However, the legal system, uh, public public funding still exists, right, for, for, for a legal aid system. So pro bono lawyers have been uh, interested. Private sector, um, no. And the tension here is, and this has to be said and made explicit, um, and this goes for the doctors as well, um, and I want to make clear that I'm not speaking against any one particular lawyer or the profession of lawyering, or the practice of doctoring, or the pr pr practice or the profession of medicine. However, there is a lot of money to be made and being made precisely by the same professionals um, that hold the system together, right? And whose labor and handsome incomes where doctoring is privatized actually in, in Canada or, or the doc, doctors are um, self-employed, so entrepreneurs, okay? So that's how that happens. Or lawyers in private practice, right? So, or immigration consultants. These are, these are big uh, money makers. And so the Canadian immigration system, the, the idea that people come and extract, they come and they work like dogs and cats. We all know people like that. Some of us are related or, 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 or live among such, such, such people, right, who have come to our countries. Um, um, right, so the, so, so, yeah, so, so the idea that, um, you know, the, the, the immigration system is, um, is a big money maker and it's a big, it's a big um, employer in Canada. It's, it's, it's one of the pillar social institutions, right? And this is how it's maybe not surprising because this is an uncomfortable subject, but immigration and immigration history is taught poorly and understood even more poorly in Canada, although everyone has an opinion about migrants or immigrants or um, the way things should be run, right, without the knowledge, um, but all sorts of opinions. And so this is the underbelly of the thing in that it, it, it is a big, it's, it's a big structure and this is how this work is important because it demystifies and it makes it about practices and it makes it about human contributions and ways of working, right? And so it, so when I was thinking about this and how I could make the, another analogy, we talked about home, but you know, the lawyers and the doctors are really the bark on the tree, right? Around the, the tree that is the immigration system and they really hold it together um, through their labor, right? And in terms of the inside of the tree or the rings in the tree, this medical and admissibility system, you know, the inside of the tree is rotten and yet it's still held together through, you know, through its bark, right? And if we can imagine, you know, and, and the, the immigrant applicants are really the, not the leaves, they really are the roots, because as we see in the film, 
I mean, the whole thing only happens because people are working to immigrate. They're amassing papers, they're amassing debt, they're amassing boxes and boxes and, and, and immigrating over five to seven years sort of thing. So, I mean, it, all of the subsequent professional labor, bureaucratic labor, really depends on the prior work immigration health work in the case where people are diagnosed with something of, of, of legions of people, mostly outside of the country, but also inside of the country. And so maybe we can return to this, that spotlight on, mm -hmm. I mean, now I focused on law and lawyering as a social relation, but there's something to be said about the doctoring and, the, and, 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 and medicine as a social um, relation, ruling relation. Can you give us a bit more details there? Like, I'm really curious. I know we, you cannot tell us the whole book, so we have to wait for a year. Uh, but, yeah, like, uh, because you are saying, so the examinations happen outside Canada, but then those are doctors which are working for the Canadian state, or how does this work? And, like, with, with whom did you work and uh, with whom did you talk? Like, with doctors in Canada, outside Canada? Can you give us an idea you yeah. know, how, how that worked? Sure, sure. So the, uh, there are about a half a million um, medical examinations that happen annually, and those are conducted by doctors that are designated by, by the state, and most of those examinations happen outside of Canada. And so in the film, we see Martha, who applies from Russia, for example. So most people apply to reside permanently from outside the country, and so are medically assessed outside of the country. And... Um, in the medical world, health world, we would say or they would say people become lost to follow up. So I, I in my research, um, was only able to interview um, people who, who were in Canada, who were either spouses of Can uh, Canadians or refugees, and so their health um, is excluded from or cannot render them in inadmissible, right? So for the, for the core research here, I was I was speaking with people most 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 of whom were in Canada, um, and I wouldn't I wouldn't see people who are outside of Canada because they would be again lost, right? I mean, there's and and this is the focus of my NIAS project actually is is really getting at that population that has gone through the process of medical inadmissibility, and since I've been here in Amsterdam interviewed uh, five families and happy to say that I, I think many of them are on are part of our virtual audience as well as the co-producers of, uh, of, of the film are also dialing in right um, if I if I yeah. may I was actually yeah. wondering how do people respond to you uh, you interviewing them uh, do you keep in touch uh, how uh, yeah how does yeah. that work yeah no in a lot um, one colleague physically in the room today is, is someone I know from that era, right? A, a social worker who was in clinical practice, who now immigrated and lives in the Netherlands. And so, yeah, many, many uh, people I'm, I'm, I am still in touch with. And this line of research was really an investigation, as this current NIAS project is really an inqu critical inquiry of the system, right? Uh, but not stopping at this thing as a system and not reifying it as, it as a thing, but like looking within it and seeing what is being asked of people as, as, as applicants. So when I have interviewed these, these families, uh, and that's another great COVID success story is that everyone is now used to Zoom Fortunately, unfortunately, but we're able, you know, maybe less busy and, and, and able to meet people, at, uh, you know, on Zoom and I'm able to figure out, you know, what, 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 what is involved for people who are made medically inadmissible um, and who aren't living with HIV. So now the, the, the sort of health problematics or physical conditions have broadened from a focus on HIV to, you know, the more global experience of, of, of being alive and, and, and coping with, with our, our bodies and their different expressions, right? Um, and so, yeah, we've remained, you know, in touch with many of the people and, and, and many of, 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 of the pro bono lawyers are actually involved in the research, right? And so allies within... Oh, great stuff. Um, I was looking at our SPUI 25 colleagues and there is a question from uh, our online audience. Um, uh, I'll read it aloud. Is it in Dutch? It is in English. <laughs> um, if you would suggest a better immigration system, 
uh, immigration sel selection system, it would be interesting to suggest the point system where money, work degrees, language can dissolve negative points. Uh, but you don't think health and HIV would still have a relative important role in this system? In, in, a, in a point system? Yeah. Yeah? I mean, yeah, the, the point system, and that's what Amy was questioning. So the point system is, is, uh, is maybe the signature characteristic of the Canadian immigration system where it does select, right? It does select based on a person's um, social standing, really. Uh, and there's a class analyses that have been done about this. But yeah, it, so it does, does discriminate based, based on age, um, ability to pay, ability to pay all of the fees, um, engage in a five to seven year process, uh, put life, lives on hold in a lot of ways. Um, and so the question was around whether, whether health or HIV should not have a relative important role in this system. Well, uh, again, um, I think it's important for the state to be aware that a person has HIV. Um, the current system in Canada of mandatorily testing um, is something that needs to be um, taken away because, as my research shows, this, the manda mandatory practice gives rise to institutional practices that are problematic for the state itself, for people and a range of health providers and health processes. Um, it is important to know, um, you know, um, I mean, I, I think this is also debatable. Uh, you know, sh should we know our <laughs> HIV status? Um, if if we're not fearful of the law, if we're not fearful of, of of punitive laws that could be brought against us, as is the as is the case in Canada, actually, that has uh, you know world famous or infamous by this point um, relations of criminal law and, and criminalization of HIV, right? So yeah, knowing knowing sort of the status is one thing, and the and the the, the country I think should should know want to know what what the health or the condition to be able to channel to care and take care of, of people who will um, become, um, you know, citizens eventually. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I hope uh, uh, the question was raised by Kunrat that uh, this answers your question. I'm looking at the clock and I see that we are uh, almost at the end of this discussion. So um, I was wondering, Amy, Christine, do you have a, a final point, remark? Uh, yeah, I, so I'm very interested in fear and in empathy. <laughs> And fear works against empathy. And uh, it doesn't have to, but it does. Uh, if, if we see someone as a threat, it's very difficult to also see them as a person with inherent value. Um, and I think that's something that, that doesn't play with Down syndrome. That's really the economic case. But with HIV, um, I think... And, and now, of course, we are very used with COVID to treat each other as potential threats. Um, I think there, there would need to be uh, really an effort to, to help people um, to, to take away the threat for, for both uh, the person who, who gets this diagnosis in, in this process. Uh, and that's the question, of course, do they have to be tested or not? Well, if you want to stop the spread of a virus, then that would be implied. Um, so to take away the, the anxiety that they would have uh, of getting this diagnosis, potentially, and for the people in Canadian society, because there's a very... Uh, Canadians really identify with being a, a migrant, so, migrant society. Uh, there's very uh, high... Um, yeah, how do you how do you call it? Pe people think that it's that's a good that it's a good thing that there are migrants coming in, uh, which is not uh, a given. So I think that's a good thing to hold on to for Canadians. Um, but you need to keep that support 
uh, and I think the way uh, I think you're talking about an ideal society, which would be wonderful, but you need to be very uh, self. Uh, you need to have a, a lot of self-esteem and, and a very high sense of safety to not see other people as these potential threats when they're not known to you. So I think there, there goes the effort in taking away the fear of people. That was my closing remark. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, maybe a c uh, closing words. Close words, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, it, and um, I've appreciated this dialogue, right? Because it, we've, been, it, we've been able to have a round the table dialogue. The idea um, is, a, um, you know, uh, a key take home here is that what happens through the maintaining of this medical inadmissibility regime is that um, there is fear mongering. There is, people are made into, I, I call it risk, like risky subjects, right? They are f assessed financially from the get-go, but then conceived of through the work practices of, 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 of persons in government and outside of government. At, yeah, so as risks and, 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 and you know, legal risks, uh, safety risks, health risks. And so, I mean, the... the the problem, I, I'm agreeing with you, but the problem is, is this is in, institutionally designed, right? This sort of fear is, is institutionally created through the policies and laws and practices that are upheld, that we are up, upholding. So if, if Canadians don't like that this is happening, I mean, I could make the corollary with, you know, uh, with, with an institutional racism, right? We're... we're, we're Thankfully, in the last, you know, I don't know, couple of years, this sort of strong push away toward recognizing institutional uh, and sy systemic barriers for racialized people, non-white people, right? So here we have a system that is supporting a systemic um, disabling or a systemic um, uh, set of prejudices, right, sort of written into how the system is organized, right? So if we're uncomfortable with institutional racism, how is it that we're not uncomfortable by um, systemic ableism or systemic disabilism? Right. Yeah, I, I think I can be very short. Yeah, I, think perfect. I think it is risky and more dangerous to fear. And I think the only solution is to care. Beautiful closing words. I think this was a very interesting and fruitful conversation uh, in which we discussed the, the need to unmake uh, medical inadmissibility. Um, I really well wish you all the best with your criti critical inquiry of this system and this practice, Laura. Um, and um, indeed, uh, let's care more. Uh, <laughs> I think um, <laughs> um, closing this evening, um, I want to thank all of you, uh, Laura, Amy, Christine, uh, for your uh, attendance today, for your insights and, and views. Uh, I want to thank everyone at home uh, for watching uh, the program tonight. And I want to thank Spy25 for letting us uh, use their physical space here, which is quite um, beautiful and also very special in these weird and strange times of, of COVID. Um, I really hope you enjoyed the program and do make sure to uh, register for our next NIAS talk, which is on the 12th of January in 2021. And then we'll discuss um, how secret secret agent agencies are uh, with historian and current fellow uh, Simon Wilmots. Thank you all. And uh, I think uh, this is it for now. Thanks. Thank you.